Hello and good afternoon. I'm Mira Trahan, Associate Director of Programs at the American Constitution Society for Law and Policy. Thank you all for coming. Our program today is entitled Voter ID Laws, Preventing Fraud or Suppressing the Vote, and we have a distinguished panel of experts to address precisely that question. Our panel is going to be moderated by Tova Wang, a nationally recognized expert in election law and a democracy fellow at the Century Foundation. Tova? Thank you very much. Are these? Here we go. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, I am Tova Wang. I am at the Century Foundation, a progressive nonpartisan think tank here in D.C. Um, and this is obviously a, a hot issue, um, as you all probably know. Um, since the passage of the Help America Vote Act back in 2002, it sort of has become the controversial hot-button issue of uh, election reform. Um, although HAVA, as you probably know, only required ID for a small, small subset of, of people, um, a lot of states kind of took that as a, a cue to go even farther with it. And the 25 states now have ID laws that go beyond the mandates of the Help America Vote Act. Um, six of those states require photo ID. And now we have Georgia and Indiana, and to some degree Florida, requiring government-issued photo identification from every voter when they come to the polls. And as you probably are aware, this is now the subject of a tremendous amount of litigation with the Indiana case going to the Supreme Court now, and they've, they've agreed to hear it. Um, basically, proponent, proponents of ID believe that polling place fraud um, in terms of people showing up at the polls and pretending to be someone else or someone or using the name of someone who is dead, they believe it's, it's rampant. And, and it goes undetected a lot of the time. Um, it doesn't, people don't get caught in the act, but it does exist. They also believe that ID is necessary for all sorts of things, getting on an airplane, getting into federal buildings, and so pretty much everyone has one, and that um, for people who don't have it, it's not really that big of a deal to be able to get it. Opponents on the other side point out actually that there's an extreme scarcity of polling place fraud of the type that um, ID would address, and that this is really a solution in, in search of a problem and that there are large numbers of people who don't have the requisite ID, and that it is actually very hard for some people to get an ID, so hard, in fact, that it amounts to a poll tax. This um, debate, as you may have noticed, has become extremely political. Um, it has been completely politicized, and it actually kind of has been from the beginning, um, right back to when they, they were debating the Help America Vote Act. Um, there's a real divide in worldview when you hear people talk about voter identification laws and the issue of fraud. And I think this was really exemplified by um, Judge Posner's opinion in the Seventh Circuit case that was appealed to the Supreme Court and, and the dissent. And I just want to read you a little bit from those opinions because I think they really um, demonstrate the difference of, of worldview on this subject. This is Posner upholding the ident identification requirement in Indiana, which is the strictest in the nation, government-issued photo ID. He says, even though it is exceedingly difficult to maneuver in today's America without a photo ID, try flying or even entering a tall building such as the courthouse in which we sit without one, and as a consequence, the vast majority of adults have such identification, the Indiana law will deter some people from voting. A great many people who are eligible to vote don't bother to do so. Many do not register, and many who do register still don't vote or vote infrequently. The benefits of voting to the individual voter are elusive. A vote in a political election rarely has any instrumental value since elections for political office at the state or federal level are never decided by just one vote. And even very slight costs in time or bother or out-of-pocket expense deter many people from voting, or at least from voting in elections they're not much interested in. So some people who have not bothered to obtain a photo ID will not bother to do so just to be allowed to vote. And a few who have a photo ID but forget to bring it to the polling place will say, what the hell, and not vote, rather than go home and get the ID and return to the polling place. No doubt most people who don't have photo ID are low on the economic ladder and thus, if they do vote, are more likely to vote for Democratic than Republican candidates. Um, the democratically appointed judge in dissent in that case said, let's not beat around the bush. The Indiana voter photo ID law is a not too thinly veiled attempt to discourage election day turnout by certain folks believed to skew democratic. We should subject this law to strict scrutiny, or at least in the wake of Burdick, something akin to strict scrutiny light, and strike it down as an undue burden on the fundamental right to vote. So as you can tell from this exchange, um, this is very political. And you also saw it in the uh, U.S. Attorney's scandal where 
um, allegedly uh, certain U.S. attorneys were fired for not vigorously enough pursuing voter fraud cases that they didn't believe mm -hmm. there was enough evidence of to, to bring. Um, you also saw in the uh, preclearance of the Georgia photo ID law, you've seen that become very politicized, especially in the last few days when um, John Tanner, who's the head of the voting section of the Department of Justice, um, came out with some really interesting remarks at a, a speech he was giving to a Latino group. Um, he was talking about that ID laws are, are very much a state-by-state -state issue and they come, it all comes down to who has ID and who doesn't. And what he said is, I think it's probably true that among those who don't, it's primarily elderly persons. And that's a shame, he said. You know, creating problems for elderly persons just is not good under any circumstance. Of course, that also ties in with the racial aspect because our society is such that minorities don't become elderly the way that white people do. They die first. So anything that disproportionately impacts the elderly has the opposite impact on minorities. Just the math is such as that. The minorities in Georgia, statistically slightly, are more likely to have ID. Um, so this is the person who, um, as uh, is well known now, overrode the judgment of uh, the career attorneys in the Department of Justice to pre-clear the Georgia ID requirement. And I also have my own little brush with the politicization of this um, when I was uh, asked to do a research project with a Republican counterpart on the subject of fraud and intimidation uh, for the U.S. Election Assistance Commission. And um, when we came out with our report, which said that there was very little evidence to date, uh, from what we could tell, of uh, widespread polling place fraud, the um, EAC rewrote sections of the report to perhaps make it appear as if uh, there was great debate on this subject rather than what we found, which was there was not actually a lot of great debate on this. So with um, that introduction, I am going to uh, introduce some of our panelists. Um, the first person who's going to speak is Julie Fernandez. And uh, Julie is the senior policy analyst and special counsel at the Leadership Conference for Civil Rights. And Julie, what I want to start out asking you is, uh, why, what's bad about ID? I mean, why, why does it as you see it, disenfranchise people? Who does it, does it impact some people more than others? Why is it a problem? Thanks, Tova. Um, first, I just, um, I'm, I'm going to answer your question, but I do have to, I want to respond a little bit to kind of the, even the introduction of this debate. Because I want us to really try hard to get away from thinking of this issue through a partisan lens and go back to the Constitution. Because I think that a lot of people, as this is another one of those issues out there that unfortunately has been turned into a partisan, turned into being seen as a partisan fight on the backs of African American and Latino voters, as well as older Americans and those with disabilities. So I'd like to kind of try, if we can, to reframe what we're talking about here about the Constitution. And to understand that what we're also talking, we're talking about the Constitution, we're talking about the fundamental right to vote. The Supreme Court in Rounds versus Sims and other cases has said that the right to vote is fundamental. It's preservative of all other rights, right? So we're talking about not whether, um, it's not whether it makes sense or is rational for states to have voter ID laws because they serve some interest that they think is worthy, right? Let's look at the poll tax. The poll tax, in fact, makes sense. You pay $5 to vote, you pay $10 to vote, help subsidize the election process. It, you know, isn't that much money, right? But what's wrong with the poll tax is not that it doesn't make rational sense. It's that it's impinging on a fundamental right to vote in a way that disproportionately impacts African Americans and Latinos. Isn't that what's wrong with the poll tax? Not that it doesn't make sense. And I think that's the way to look also at voter ID laws. Um, here, I think we're talking about voter ID laws that are really, um, as Tova said, the Indiana case everyone's talking about, and the sort of the, what I'm going to talk about in my brief remarks, and I think we're all going to talk mostly about, are the, not just any old voter ID laws. We've had voter ID laws for a long time that says you have to show some kind of ID at the polls. Some kind of ID was often very broad in Georgia before the more recent laws. It was 17 different forms of ID that you could show, um, a utility bill, a bank statement, other things. Um, and then if you didn't have your ID, then you could do what I call an affidavit bypass. You could essentially swear under penalty of law that you are who you say you are. And then you could vote, right? 
So those kind of laws are not shown to be proven. They are typically pre had been pre-cleared by the Department of Justice as, non as not retrogressive when they were imposed in various states. There was a way um, – it was not really impinging on the right to vote. The kind of ideas laws we're talking about now are those that have a hard requirement for a government-issued photo ID that you have to show or you don't vote. And this whole idea of going to the clerk and then getting permission to come back, I mean, I'm sorry, nobody's going to do that. Particularly people who are on an hourly wage who don't get to have the whole day off to screw around with trying to vote, right? They have to get back to work. No one's doing that. So these are about laws that say if you don't have a government-issued photo ID, you're denied your right to vote fundamentally. And others will talk about what, what problem this is supposed to cure, and I'll talk a little bit about the impact. So um, the question we have to ask is, um, it's kind of the balancing question of what is the seriousness of the problem that others will talk about, and then what's the impact on the fundamental right to vote? And this is all done in the context of the intersection of race, which I hope we don't lose in the conversation. So who do these ID laws, ID laws like in Georgia and Indiana, fall the hardest on? Well, people who traditionally are um, facing barriers at the polls. And I'll just have some stats that you all may be very familiar with. But in, according to the Georgia chapter of AARP, 36% of Georgians over age 75 don't have a driver's license. Have they lost their right to vote? What about African Americans? There was a study that was done in Wisconsin that I actually found on the Heritage Foundation's website that in Wisconsin, 80% of men and 81% of women had valid driver's licenses. 45% of African American men, 51% of African American women have driver's licenses. That's a huge difference. That's what I call the denial of the right to vote. Uh, the Brennan Center did this um, study. There's very lot. There's not that much data that is that hard and that good around these issues, unfortunately. Brennan Center did a study, a survey, to try and get some better numbers to look at uh, the impact, and they found that 25 percent of African Americans of voting age have no current government-issued photo ID. I want to stress the word current also. Not your old ID that lapsed, but a current one and often one that has your current address on it. That makes it valid, right? It's a very small, um, uh, it's a large number of percentage of people in these communities that are very uh, much affected. I want to talk a bit about people who are um, um, low-income Americans. So low-income Americans are much, le much less likely to have a valid government issue photo ID. Why? I always love this thing about airplanes and federal buildings for two reasons. One, didn't Hurricane Katrina teach us anything about poor people? Poor people don't fly. We're all flying. They're not. They're also not going into federal buildings, and they're not cashing checks. Sorry, folks, but they're not. So they're not. This whole notion that everybody's got it, we've all got it in our pocket, they don't but they still have the right to vote, don't they, right? And I, I also love this thing that says, well, since you have to have an ID to fly an airplane or go in a federal building, then certainly you should have it to vote since voting is more important. Whoa. Isn't that the opposite, right? <laughs> since voting is more important, shouldn't we protect it more than going into federal buildings and flying on airplanes, right? Like, shouldn't you still have your right to vote even if we're going to deny you the right to fly? Isn't flying more optional than the right to vote should be? That always gets me. The other um, thing I'll just say, because I know I'm going on too long, is that um, ID requirements that have no affidavit bypass also open the door to discrimination in the polling place. We've just gone through this process of reauthorizing the Voting Rights Act, where we had 98 nothing in the Senate, overwhelming vote in the House. Everybody agrees we still have discrimination in voting. Everybody agrees. Maybe not everybody, but the entire Congress does. What on earth do they all agree on? But they all agree on that. So does President Bush sign the bill. So we know we still have a problem, but yet voter ID laws present a lot of opportunity for discretion in the polling place. Because typically you're going to ask ID of people who? Who? It offers a wide range of discretion of who to ask ID of and whether that ID is going to meet your requirements. Is it valid enough? 
And in an atmosphere where we know race-based discrimination is still going on, that's going to fall more heavily on minority populations. And to a large extent, the last thing I will say is this notion of citizenship. Um, the Real ID, which you all may know about, uh, this law that was passed, would require that you have a, an ID card that proves your citizenship when you vote. Okay, if you're, well, the whole idea of this sort of stopping undocumented people from voting. I mean, if you're undocumented, are you voting? You're going to go into a polling place where they have government officials? If you're undocumented, trust me, you're not voting. You're looking to stay out of the limelight. You don't want people asking a lot of, I mean, you're, you're there, you know, you're not looking to get caught, typically. Um, but what this law would do is it would make a requirement on all of us that we have proof of citizenship when we vote. Who right now sitting here has their passport in their pocket? Okay, she can vote and so can you. Nobody else can if the polling place were right here right now. What percentage of Americans have passports? Different estimates, somewhere around 25%. Any other document you have that proves your citizenship? Anybody? If you were naturalized after 2001, I think you have something. If you were naturalized after 2001, I think you have a document with your picture on it that says you're a citizen. The rest of you don't. This is about the right to vote. I'm done. <laughs> I'm sorry, I went long. Thanks, Julie. Um, next, we're going to hear from Robert Kellner, who's a partner and chair of the election and political law practice at Covington and Burlington. And Rob, uh, so you probably don't agree with some of what's been said so far. Probably, probably. And so, I mean, let me ask you, why, why should we have ID? Why is that something that we need to do to ensure the right, that the, the voting process has integrity? Well, I'm the underdog today. I'm outnumbered four to one. I remember going to Federalist Society debates in, in law school where there was always the one token liberal on the panel, and I watched him you know, <laughs> turn in the breeze. So this is, this is everything you know, that comes around goes around. Um, you know, we for, for many, many, many years in this country have built into the election system impediments to voting. We've built into the system burdens on voting for decades, for longer than decades, as have most other democratic countries around the world. The most notable example is registration, voter registration, which is a significant burden on voting. Um, there is ample research showing that the voter registration laws probably reduce turnout in elections by something like 5 or 10 percent. Um, the longer away from election day the, the deadline is, uh, the greater the impact. We've had those laws relatively uncontroversially, perhaps outside the activist community, for many, many years because Americans understand that to have a fair election system where people respect the legitimacy of the vote, you need to have devices in the system to deter fraud. And that means burdens on voting, burdens that have to be modest, burdens that have to be measured and reasonable. Most Americans think that requiring identification at the polls is a modest and reasonable further step in addition to the registration laws to reduce the chance of fraud. And when I say most, I mean the polling data is overwhelming. You rarely see levels of support that we see for um, voter identification at the polls, including, I might add, very strong support within the minority community in these polls. It's in fact hard to find people something like 7% in the latest polling data that oppose um, voter identification laws. So we have these laws to preserve the integrity of the system. Um, do we know that voter fraud is rampant? I mean, that's certainly not my position, that, that it is rampant. Do we know that it occurs? We know that it occurs in some cases. And more to the point, perhaps I'm a cynic about human nature, but I assume that in any situation where a lot is at stake, whether it be money in a commercial context or whether it be power in a political context, that people will exploit gaps in the system. It is human nature. And it will tend to happen not on an aggregate scale um, all across the country. It will tend to happen in very important races, in very tight races, in races that are in districts for which for one reason or another tend to have more lax enforcement of the election laws, people will find the gaps in the system. And this is a reasonable measure to address that gap. I might add 
Um, there has been some very sophisticated research done very recently on this issue. It's true there didn't used to be much data on this issue. But within the last six weeks, two major studies have come out, one by MIT and Caltech jointly, one by the University of Delaware and the University of Nebraska. Um, both of those studies found absolutely no indication that the voter identification laws that already have existed in various forms had any racially discriminatory impact. Indeed, ironically, the MIT Caltech study found that there was um, an effect on voter turnout, voter turnout, which was that it very slightly depressed voting by white voters. Um, the Delaware study found no impact whatsoever in terms of a racial differential effect. The Delaware study found no effect on voter turnout overall without regard to race. And the Caltech MIT study found a slight impact, slightly statistically significant impact on overall um, voter turnout, but again, no impact in terms of a racial differential. That is the best, most current research that exists on the topic. So I reject the notion that there's really any substantial evidence that these laws have had any racially differential impact. I would note that we have a natural experiment here. We have a range of different voter identification laws that have come into play over a period of years, and so there is raw data that the researchers have made use of. Thanks, Rob. Um, next up, we are going to hear from Spencer Overton. Spencer is the uh, uh, professor of law at GW University Law School. And, and Spencer, um, getting to the, the, the fraud side of this question, um, is this a, a solution in search of a problem? Do we, or is there, as Rob says, in, especially in, in close races, um, human nature is such that you're going to have fraud? Um, thank you, Tova. I think the, the simple answer is we don't know, because I don't think we have the, the data. The, we do have some studies. Uh, that show, um, you know, very few instances of fraud and convictions for fraud. But, you know, frankly, uh, that may be un unrepresentative because there may be some fraud that exists that is not uh, convicted, right? So we, we really don't have good data in terms of fraud. I, I would agree with Rob that we are starting to get um, some data with regard to impact on voter turnout. I think, and, and Deborah can correct me and, and fill in some details, my understanding of the MIT uh, Caltech study is that race was isolated as a factor. And, and so, in other words, income and education uh, wasn't uh, uh, there. So uh, Sam Hurst, the partner at Jenner, uh, well, I'm not in his same socioeconomic class uh, here as a law professor, but, yeah, maybe we both have uh, IDs in our pocket, right? But perhaps there are more African Americans of lower education and lower income levels. M my understanding is they isolated the racial factor away from other issues in terms of, of income and education. But I do, um, I do appreciate the fact that Rob is focused on uh, evidence, and I think that that is important. I think it is important to have measured and reasonable uh, um, um, uh, procedures in terms of voting. The problem, though, is that much of this is based on speculation, on anecdote, on analogies that are inexact. Um, Julie mentioned about uh, boarding planes and uh, using uh, federal buildings uh, ID in, in these places. Th there are a couple of issues here. The analogy just doesn't work, and the analogy doesn't work because there's a big difference between saying we're going to keep 10,000 legitimate flyers off the plane uh, in order to stop one terrorist. There's a difference between that and saying, hey, we're going to stop 10,000 legitimate voters 
in order to stop one fraudulent voter. Another note with the flying is there actually is a bypass procedure, the affidavit type of procedure that Julie mentioned in terms of voting. Uh, if you show up to the airport without your ID, you just go through a more extensive search procedure. So it, it really is an inexact analogy, and a lot of the analysis is based upon inexact analogies as well as uh, anecdotal evidence in, in terms of, of fraud, things like, well, Mickey Mouse is on the rolls, and therefore there's the potential for fraud. The question is, is Mickey Mouse uh, voting? Uh, John Fund uh, talks about uh, the terrorists being registered in Virginia. I had my research assistant look into that, uh, call the uh, elections commissioner in Virginia. Uh, they, the elections commission in Virginia could not find evidence. Uh, that the 911 hijackers were registered to, to vote in Virginia. And so my, my point is that we really can't just focus on anecdotes or imperfect analogies. I appreciate the fact that people are supportive of photo ID. I, I think that that's absolutely right. But I think there was a time when a lot of people thought that the poll tax was a very good idea. There are a lot of people who thought that literacy tests were very reasonable because the thought was, hey, we want educated people to make decisions in our democracy and we'll have better decisions if, if people can read the newspaper and engage in democratic debate uh, with, with poll taxes, as Julie mentioned. Thought is, hey, we're going to have money, so we'll have more machines and be able to pay poll workers and we'll have smoother running uh, elections. So, so certainly um, there were times when people believed that poll taxes were good, literacy tests were good, but after you have some public education about numbers and about how this actually works out, uh, you know, I, I think that maybe we can come to a different conclusion. But, but for me, at the end of the day, this really needs to be based on data, data about the amount of fraud, data about the adverse impact uh, of uh, photo ID. We're moving in that direction. I don't think that we're, we're quite there yet. Thanks, Spencer. Um, next we're going to hear from Deborah Goldberg, who is the um, head of the democracy uh, program at the Brennan Center at NYU Law School. And I hear a lot, Deborah, that um, it, it's polling place fraud that doesn't really exist very often. Um, and that's the only kind of um, fraud that ID would prevent. So are we saying that actually there is other type of fraud that we should be doing other things about that we should be focusing more on? I think that it's really important that we use our terminology very carefully. There's a little bit of an Orwellian slippage that's going on here when people talk about fraud. Voter fraud, which is the only thing that ID purportedly addresses, is the intentional voting by somebody who knows they are not entitled to vote. Okay? It is not registering a bunch of people by putting their names you know, off of a telephone book onto the voter registration polls, okay? That is a type of dishonest activity, but it is not voter fraud, and it is not addressed by photo ID, photo ID okay? Um, destroying voter registration forms um, because you happen not to agree, perhaps, with the partisan affiliation of the voter. That is dishonest activity. That does occur. That is not voter fraud, and it is not addressed by photo ID. Vote buying, somebody pays somebody to vote in a particular way, okay? That is not voter fraud, and that is not addressed by voter ID, photo ID. Stuffing the ballot box, okay? If you want to take a, advantage of gaps in the system and throw an election, then what you do is find a way where you can do a little bit more wholesale shifting of votes, like stuffing a ballot box, or alternatively, you know, stashing the ballots in the trunk of your car, okay? Both of those are illegal activity. They are not voter fraud, and they are not addressed by photo ID. Photo ID addresses one problem, impersonation fraud. You are walking into a polling place and claiming to be somebody who you are not and voting. Now that's a logistically difficult thing to do because you have to know in advance who's on the registration list that's not going to show up so that you can come in and say that you're that person. 
It carries a penalty, if you're caught, of up to five years in prison and a $10,000 fine. If you're a non-citizen, you can be deported for doing that. So there are huge disincentives for doing it in order to get one extra vote. Statistically, the American voter is more likely to get hit by lightning than they are to commit impersonation fraud. And that is the only thing that voter ID, photo ID, addresses. Now, real problems, there are real problems. I've mentioned four or five of them already. You know, deceptive practices that people have been using or intimidation techniques, sending out flyers into low-income neighbor, neighborhoods telling people that they should go to a different polling place than the one that they're actually assigned to or on a different day than election day. Those are real problems. There is a law that has been proposed to address that. That won't be addressed by photo ID either. Hacking an electronic uh, machine, you want to shift an election, that's a good way to do it. It's the you know, modern equivalent of stuffing the ballot box. Okay? There are lots of things that could be done to protect the security of our electronic voting machines. We can, pre we can uh, prevent the use of wireless components. We can do post-election audits. Um, we can do parallel testing. We have a whole study of the different things that you can do if you're interested in how to protect your electronic voting machines, but photo ID will not do it. Okay? So from my perspective, um, what we have here is, you know, the proverbial grenade to kill the flea. There's virtually no problem, and the purported solution is far more disenfranchising than the issue that it is supposedly going to address. In a, in a nation where what we have is a fundamental right at stake, it seems to me that if we value it enough the way we value our liberties, we have a presumption of innocence, we should have a presumption of eligibility, and we should be rebutting that presumption only with very clear and concrete evidence that a particular voter is not entitled to vote. We should not be setting up systems, whole systems that disenfranchise categories of people based on allegations of very generalized allegation of dishonesty and very little evidence of impersonation fraud. I want to say also one thing about uh, two points that were made earlier. Um, the new studies of voter ID did not distinguish between all these different types of ID. If you lump them all together, you're going to get a very different um, result than if you separate out government-issued photo ID from some of these other types of ID that really don't seem to have very much of an impact and none of us are really worried that much about. Secondly, in terms of the widespread support for photo ID, it isn't surprising that 80% of the American public supports photo ID when 80% of the American public has photo ID. <laughs> but what we know is that when people become educated about the large numbers, we're talking about millions of people here who do not have photo ID, public support drops. Um, you know, the right to vote is a right that belongs to all of us. We should be protecting it for everyone and certainly it should not be, um, people should not be deprived of it because they cannot produce a government-issued photo ID. Thanks, Deborah. Um, before I ask a couple of questions and then open it up to the floor, I want to give Rob an opportunity to uh, have, add any further comments that he may have in response to what he's, sure. <laughs> he's heard. A uh, lot of ground to cover, but I'll try to do it briefly. You know, Spencer says, well, look, we don't really know whether there is fraud. It's a valid question, and, you know, we'd love to see some data. So let's go out and, and get some data. And until we get the data, let's do nothing in this area. Let's put everything in abeyance until we have the data. And, you know, uh, I might sometimes agree with that approach, but the reality is the courts have not taken that approach. And it, it's so interesting because I hear echoes of the campaign finance debate throughout this debate over the photo ID laws. We more or less took the position that Spencer's taking in the McConnell case, the McCain-Feingold campaign finance case. We said, what corruption? What appearance of corruption? Let's see real data to establish that soft money contributions establish some kind of a 
corruption or appearance of corruption. But the court said, no, you don't really need that, even though this is a First Amendment fundamental rights um, context. We think it's reasonable to think that people might believe there's some connection here. And we're not going to require hard data. There may be an absence of data. There was an absence of data, but the Supreme Court didn't care. So the law is, in this broadly in the area of regulating political speech, that where there's a serious government interest at stake in the integrity of the system, whether it be with regard to corruption, whether it be with regard to election fraud, that there is great deference to the legislature to regulate the process in reasonable ways. And um, ultimately, this is a question, I believe, that is up to the legislatures and to the people through di direct balloting to decide where that reasonable balance is. By the way, where there is data, and we're getting some recently, what we're hearing is my friends on the panel don't like the data. The two most recent, most compelling, most sophisticated studies, which really severely undercut their position, and which I encourage you all to read, they're on the web, um, they don't like. They don't like the data the way it's coming out. Spencer's example about airports, you know, I've not used that example, so, but he's responding to an argument that I guess others have made about the fact that everybody needs ID to get through an airport these days. There is one telling thing about the airport example. And Spencer says, well, you know, we've made this judgment that to stop one terrorist, we will stop 10,000 people from easily getting through an airport. And that's true. We've made a value judgment, a subjective value judgment, as to how worried we are about the one issue, meaning our safety, um, and we've weighed that against the other issue, convenience. That's a purely subjective value judgment, really without regard to the numbers, which goes to the point that this is not all about data. If you believe that voter integrity is of paramount importance, and if you believe that modest steps should be taken to improve voter integrity, then there is a perfectly sound basis for supporting photo ID laws. Now, we might debate whether the burden is modest or not. Um, but again, there, I think we can look at the data that already exists, which is pretty compelling, and we can look at the reality that we already have a system with very high hurdles to, to voting. We've had that for many, many years. So the argument we're hearing today ultimately really has to be an argument against the entire voter registration system. I don't see how you can logically sustain the argument that's being made against the photo ID laws without carrying it through to opposition to really to the entire structure of voter registration in this country, which is a huge burden on voting, and all the data shows that. But Americans have found that to be an acceptable, acceptable burden, as, by the way, has virtually every other democratic country on the planet, dozens of which have photo, uh, uh, photo identification laws and have had them for many years. This debate is rather an eccentric American debate. Um, finally, the argument that the photo identification laws are inadequate or unsound because they don't address all of the other forms of corruption. Again, very much the same debate that came up in the McConnell case over campaign finance regulation. And again, the court said, you don't have to deal with the entire problem all at once. You can take baby steps. You can take reasonable steps to attack the problem, in this case, of voter fraud piece by piece. Indeed, one might think it is more prudent to attack the problem step by step to examine the effects of the regulations before moving to the next level of regulation. But I, for one, certainly would ultimately support regulation of the absentee voting process, um, regula further regulation of the registration process, and any other areas in which my colleagues on the panel <laughs> perceive there to be a fraud problem outside the context of voter fraud. Oh, well, thanks. Yeah. Let me just. Can I please? Yeah. One second. <laughs> <laughs> one note just about, let me chime in on this debate over the, the, the studies that were done. Um, the Mike Alvarez, Jonathan Katz, Celia Bailey um, study out of Caltech, I think. Actually, the takeaway from that study is that um, ID disproportionately burdens low income and, more, and less educated voters. Um, and when you take that into account, since unfortunately in this country uh, minorities tend to be poor and tend to have less education, there probably is some overlap, but they separated it out. Um, just want to, let me, let me go to Spencer for one second and ask him if he, he agrees that it's appropriate 
as they may, may have done in McConnell, to um, not really worry about whether there's data or not, um, or evidence, and, and just sort of go with their, their instincts on this, as I think you, know, you, you might have seen happen with, with Judge Posner or the court in Purcell. Well, you know, I'm going to let Deborah okay. uh, expand on it. I will quickly, though, say that my understanding is that there was an expansive record uh, below uh, that the Brennan Center was very much involved in. And, and the whole point here was to determine whether this was over-inclusive, under-inclusive, and the thought is uh, that you determine uh, – how many instances is a state interest advanced versus how many times is, let's say, the protected liberty interest infringed upon that poses no danger in terms of the state interest? That's like a, you know, a, a long, convoluted uh, constitutional uh, 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 statement. But, but my point is there were some numbers. There were several numbers. Here, uh, below, in terms of the Seventh Circuit, th there really is no attempt to engage in, well, how many instances occur in which we're preventing people from casting a ballot who are legitimately registered voters? Uh, how many times is a fraudulent uh, voter uh, coming to the polls? And the state's interest in preventing fraud is furthered by this ID requirement. So, so there wasn't really that... Um, you know, there just hasn't been that type of, of sophisticated analysis. But, Deborah, let me defer to you on that. I think that there's, it's a real false analogy to draw between corruption and the appearance of corruption and fraud and the fear of fraud. And the reason for that is because, as Spencer mentioned, is that there's a lot of evidence out there of actual corruption. We have lots of prosecutions. We had lots of testimony short of actual prosecutions about how the money was influencing the system by members of Congress who, you know, who had experience in the matter and could talk about it from their own firsthand observations. Um, and the, the reason that the court was willing to uh, recognize both actual corruption and the perception of corruption as legitimate interests um, that could support regulation was because um, they understood that there was lots of actual corruption and the perception was probably very well founded in many cases, even if it couldn't be proven in all of the cases. Fraud is a different situation. There, you know, we, again, we are talking about impersonation fraud. There is no evidence that there is widespread impersonation fraud. And the fear that is being uh, fostered is being fostered because people are not focusing on what they're talking about. Okay? I am all for step-by-step -step measures to prevent dishonesty in elections theft of elections or destruction of voting rights. But it would seem to me that it would make the most sense to focus on the real problems and not to supposedly take baby steps by focusing on something that is completely not damaging to the system. You know, if we're really serious about measured steps, then let's focus on the integrity of our voting machines or the integrity of our, you know, registration lists or something else that could really have an impact. Instead, what we're doing is fear-mongering, getting people all head up about how much fraud there is out there, getting them to elide the differences among the various different types of fraud, and then using the fear, not the reality, the fear to justify a measure that will disenfranchise millions of people. Julie, did you want to get in on this? Yeah, um, I just wanted to add um, that I don't want us to lose sight. I kind of want to add where I started. I don't want us to lose sight of the racial impact of these laws. And I, um, um, and the laws that I'm talking about are voter ID laws that involve state, the requirement of state-issued voter ID where there's no affidavit bypass. I don't like this conflating of all voter ID laws. I don't. I don't. I haven't looked at your at the study that you referenced, but I bet you, since there were no laws like this before 2005, that these laws were not what was studied. If you, as Deborah said, if you look at voter ID law in an aggregate, 
you're getting a very convoluted picture of the impact. The impact that we need to look at, that they looked at in the Georgia case, and that they're looking at here in Indiana is about government issued photo, photo ID as a necessary requirement with no bypass. There is, they showed in Georgia, there's dispropor disproportionate impact on African Americans there and older Americans, people with disabilities. And they'll show it again, uh, be able to show it again in, in any other state that has that with any population at all. And it's kind of the double whammy. It really kind of does get my goat a little bit, this notion that like, well, you know, the reasonableness of the legislature in thinking about what's a reasonable measure, uh-uh, no. We've got the double whammy of the right to vote and the 14th Amendment. And I think that we need to care about that more and not show less deference, this notion of rationality, and, I, and more than just this notion of rationality, which is, that's their like secret weapon, right? Proponents of this law. Rational basis. It's rational. It's all rational. We're rational. We can do whatever we want. No. It, we can't let this be something that is just left up to whether people think it's a good idea. Then we have the poll tax, because that's rational too. The other point I want to make is that, um, and it's just to reinforce what Deborah just said, which is just so true. People who are proponents of voter ID laws are doing it in order to stop certain people from voting whether it's a political interest or any other kind of interest, that's why they're promoting them. And they're, this whip-up notion of, of polling place impersonation and then making it all as differences into one, scaring the bejesus out of people, and then saying, well, I've got the answer. Now that you're scared, it's funny. They argue sometimes about we need voter ID laws to restore the sense of integrity in the election system. Y'all are undermining the feeling of integrity by whipping people up, making them think like everybody's in there impersonating people to, uh, in the voting booth. No one's doing that. But you scare us enough, then you give us a solution. But I've got the solution, voter ID laws. State government issued ID, no bypass. That's what you need, then you'll be done. Right? They've created a problem and then a solution which serves their partisan interest on the backs of African Americans, older Americans, people with disabilities, and low income people. I just think that is wrong. I'm just going to ask one more question, and then I'm going to open it up to the audience. Um, and let me actually just let you know that we are actually going to leave. Uh, we're going to close it closer to 1:30 because there's a, a hearing that some folks are testifying at on the panel right after this. Um, Deborah, let me let me throw this to you. Um, what? Why? Judge Murphy in, in Georgia seemed to think that basically, I mean, the, the the plaintiffs that they had in that case. Yes, it would have been difficult, but since the, the Georgia state government was providing free identification for people, that that solved the problem. Um, why is that not the answer? Why not just provide ID to everyone for free and then that's your answer? Well, the question is what do they have to do in order to get the, the free ID, right? Um, if you have to come in and you have to f prove your citizenship before you can get your free ID, then the ID is not so free because you have, if, unless you, if you don't, if you have to go out and get a, a new birth certificate, or you have to go out and get a passport, or you have to go out and get naturalization papers, it can cost up to two hundred dollars. If you have to do it on a day, on a work day in Georgia, in, in the earlier stages, they were um, doing these mobile, um, you know, voter ID vans, and they would, you know, they would be in one or two, one location for a day or two during the work day, so people would have to leave their jobs in order to do it. And the, um, you know, even it, 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 to get a driver's license, I mean, there was not a, uh, a driver's license bureau in the city of Atlanta. There were about 50 of them for about three times as many counties in the state of Georgia. So you're traveling, you're taking time off of work, you're getting your citizenship proof. It's not as simple as it sounds. Okay, let me, let me open it up. I think there are people with microphones in the audience, so anyone have questions? I see. Here in the blue shirt. Thank you. Yeah, I have a question for Robert Kellner, and that is um, I assume that you probably do not agree with what Julie Fernandez just said that um, the, you, were, you were claiming that the recent studies show very little impact of voter ID laws. Um, and Julie Fernandez was saying, well, those studies must not be pertaining to the more recent voter ID laws, which don't have a bypass and which require government ID. Presumably, your position, I mean, I'm curious, first of all, is your position that the impact is going to be minimal or is minimal, even if there is no bypass and if it's government ID? And if that is your position, 
Um, what do you say about the fact that so many people in the United States don't have government ID? Um, the only conclusion that I can draw from your position is that you um, are coming from a position in which uh, millions of Americans wouldn't be voting anyway. In other words, it doesn't matter that we're requiring these IDs because there are millions of Americans who simply aren't interested enough to vote. Is that your position? Because obviously there are millions of people who don't have government ID. Well, that, that's certainly part of the, the calculus. I mean, we don't know. I think um, Spencer cites a figure in his Michigan Law Review article of up to 20 million Americans that don't have uh, driver's licenses or uh, something to that effect. We don't know how many of those are people who would vote or would not vote um, if, uh, if having a driver's license was, was an issue or was not an issue. We just don't have um, data on that or a sense on that now. I don't rule out the possibility that voter identification laws might depress overall voter turnout. It's possible. I don't know the answer particularly. The data so far doesn't remotely support that. But I don't rule out the possibility. Um, in my judgment, we're going to have um, some compromises that we have to make to ensure election integrity. We've already made many of those com compromises, and they've already resulted in depressed voter turnout in this country. Um, so I don't see um, this particular issue as materially different from other instances in which we have made that trade-off in the past. Spencer? Okay. Yeah, I, I just right. wanted to say that you know, I agree with Rob that the data is not the alpha and the omega. It's not the beginning and the end. But it really is important. It's, un it's important to understand both the magnitude of fraud and the magnitude of voters who will be excluded so that we can make this compromise, so that we can do this kind of effective cost-benefit uh, analysis here. I agree with Rob that, you know, values are at play here and, you know, the, the, the 1 to 10,000 uh, uh, value judgment we've made with, with airplanes is different, at least for me, because the purpose to me of, of, of democracy is government of, by, and for the people. Right now, there are some other people who don't believe that everyone should be able to vote, and that you know, if you can jump over a hurdle or you have to show some effort in order to participate, and that's good. Yeah, there, there are different values that we have about voting, but we need the facts so we can have an honest conversation, as opposed to somebody on one side just saying, "Hey, there's, there's no depression of, of turnout, and there's a lot of fraud," and the other person arguing the other, uh, the reverse, and just kind of arguing past one another. Finally, and you know, this is a point that I think Rob brings up in the campaign finance context, uh, uh, um, and, and I think it's a, a legitimate uh, uh, argument, uh, at least to make, is this entrenchment notion. Uh, the, the concept that just as politicians engage in gerrymandering to benefit their incumbency or their party, uh, that they will twist election rules in order to shape the electorate in a way that benefits them. And so entrenchment is an important consideration uh, as well uh, uh, here. So data, values, entrenchment, th these are all, I think, uh, uh, big concerns. Are there other questions? Can I just um, respond for a moment? Yes. I, would, I would like to sort of take head on the argument that because we're disenfranchising voters all the time, we can do it more and more without <laughs> any repercussions. Um, I would agree that voter registration is, in fact, depressing voter turnout. I don't actually think that that's a good thing. Um, and I actually think that there's a lot more that we could be doing to make voter registration easier in this country and less of a deterrent to voting. Um, the fact that we are now living with a system that is far from perfect is not reason to make it worse, in my view. Um, and you should be interested in knowing that, in fact, in North Dakota, there is no voter registration. Um, most people don't know that, but there's also no people in North Dakota. So, um, I, I also wanted to uh, – I hope there's nobody here from uh, – uh, <laughs> um, I also wanted to, you know um, – address the issue about, you know, people in other countries do it all the time. In fact, um, in England, you do not have to show ID to vote. In Canada, you do not have to show ID to vote. 
In Sweden, you do not have to show ID to vote. In Denmark, you do not have to show ID to vote. In Germany, you have to show ID to vote if you're voting somewhere where you're not registered. Okay, but in most established democracies, we're not talking about emergency, emerging democracies, but most established democracies, you do not need to show ID to vote. And let us also remember that in these countries where they have ID, they genuinely do provide them to their people. And they're usually good for something other than voting, like health insurance. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> so you have a reason to carry it with you. So if you get run over on the way to the polls, you can go to the hospital. <laughs> You know? <laughs> we move, don't do that here. Let me move on to another <laughs> question so we can get people in here. Um, Lily, I could, you had your hand up. I wanted to thank the participants on the panel. This is very refreshing and very enlightening. I work at the Electronic Privacy Information Center, and one of our project areas I work on is voting. But the other aspect of uh, identity theft, which we would call voter identity theft, is that it doesn't stay hidden. Uh, the victims would come forward. We would be able to document that. So that's just a caveat for all the discussions about why we need to act uh, on this particular issue. The other aspect of identification and government and the power dynamic between who gets control of the process, the government controlling the process that literally leads to its own um, creation. The, the voting process. The other aspect is that we have identification requirements that are in place in many states regarding voter ID, and many voters present driver's licenses for that. But what we have are the actions of the poll workers in treating those voters who present those ID identification documents differently. Um, we have uh, ex examples that were captured as part of the uh, election day incident reporting system. Uh, it's available online where voters who presented a photo identification document, they were African American and male, they may have been told, no, this isn't sufficient, you need to come up with other forms of identification in order to be accepted or allowed to vote in the process. I wanted to know how an identification system, a universal identification system would resolve those issues of disparate treatment when presenting the same document on the election day to participate in the election. Rob, do you want to address that? What do you do about the implementation problem, poll workers sort of taking it into their own hands as to who to ask for ID and, and who not to? I think you have that problem with or without the photo ID laws. And one of the problems with the data, actually, in these studies is that it's hard to isolate whether the studies are reflecting the impact of the laws or whether they're reflecting the impact of the way in which the laws are being enforced or not enforced. And you might certainly have, I'm sure you do have, instances around the country where the poll watcher, who is, as you know, could be just about anybody, um, is implementing his or her own ver version of what the law is or what the law should be. So I don't, I don't think that issue, the issue of fair implementation, um, fundamentally gets to whether photo ID laws are a good thing or a bad law, or, or a bad thing, because I think you have that problem no matter what the registration and voting laws are. Other questions? Yes, sir. Um, well, we know, I mean, there are at least isolated cases that we know about. Um, there are the, you know, uh, 100 or so cases in Wisconsin that have been identified. One can debate a little bit about the, de the details of voter fraud at the polls, where somebody is voting, um, purporting to be voting. Uh, on behalf of somebody else or with somebody else's identity. The issue so where, to where me, are those from? Where are those hundred cases? Yeah, uh, are you talking about the task force report? I thought they were You're talking about the task force report? I'm talking about the hundred cases in the yes. of those a handful got prosecuted. Right, right. but and I think that they just prosecuted. had problems. Number one, Wisconsin is an election day registration. So the study only focused on people right. who let, registered let me, on election day? If I could day. finish answering the question. Yeah, let's okay, let's I'm, sorry, I'm sorry about that. Um, it's just, I I study study Spencer's going to get into a litany of why he doesn't like that particular data set, too. And we can all, and, and respectfully, he'll have one view, I'll have another view, he'll disagree with me, I'll disagree with him. I don't think, as I said earlier, that voter fraud is rampant. That's my own personal view. Um, others on my side of the debate may have taken other positions. Um, I do think... It is incredible to me, implausible to me, to think that it doesn't happen at all. I do think that it is almost impossible to detect 
as Judge Posner said in the Seventh Circuit opinion, for obvious reasons. I do believe that where you have voter rolls that are padded with deceased individuals, not because of any ill intent, in my view, but because the voter registration system is relatively inefficient the way it's run, there is a huge opportunity for voting in the name of another. Um, and great difficulty on the behalf of the enforcement system to identify where that has occurred. Again, as I think Justice uh, Judge Posner explained pretty compellingly in his opinion. Can I point to a large number of anecdotal cases of voter fraud? No, I don't think so. Let me make real briefly one related point, which is on the question of anecdote versus data. You know, again, in the campaign finance context, in the McConnell case, the Supreme Court didn't look to data. They looked to anecdote. They looked to many, many anecdotes and said, we think this is enough. We generally get the idea. Spencer has taken issue in his writings with relying on anecdote um, in this area. I actually think the courts pretty – that train has already left the station. The courts really do rely to some extent, whether I like it or not, and I don't particularly, on episodic examples, on common sense, on whether it's reasonable for the legislature to anticipate a problem. That's the position that our Supreme Court has taken. Others? Can I just say one quick thing? I'm sorry. Yeah, I know quick, you want to though, we'll, um, only we'll a fool would try and steal an election through polling place impersonation. You're buying yourself co-conspirators every time you have someone else do it with you. You're going to have 400 co-conspirators, 10,000. How many people are you going to do this with? It's a fool's way to steal an election. No one is, I mean, if there are people who are voting because they're not supposed to be voting, they're not committing intentional impersonation of someone else. The risk is too high and it's stupid. Okay. Hi, as a question um, regarding for those who are against the voter ID laws, um, we currently live in a society where we don't have a large group of people barreling down the doors to go and vote. You know, do you foresee a time when voter ID laws may be necessary? And if so, what would that time look like? Well, if somebody were to prove to me that there was widespread impersonation fraud, then I might think about voter ID since that addresses that problem and that problem only, okay? You know, we at the Brennan Center have done some very, fairly um, serious studies about what are the real threats to our elections. You know, the threat posed by a, an electronic voting machine that has no paper trail or that has a paper trail and nobody ever audits the paper trail is far more serious than any impersonation. Um, fraud that we're seeing now. Why are we spending all of this time and energy trying to force people to show government-issued photo ID when we are ignoring problems that are far, far more threatening to the actual outcomes of elections? Um, it, it's mystifying to me. Um, I, I should also say that um, we are shortly going to be publishing a um, uh, a paper called The Truth About Voter Fraud, which goes through and fairly systematically a lot of the evidence that has been put forward and tests that uh, the claims of fraud against the reality of fraud. Um, and so I would encourage you to, to keep an eye out for that study. A lot of the underlying information is already available on our website, which is www.brennancenter.org. Or www.truthaboutfraud.org. Org? Yes. Yes. Uh, or www.truthaboutfraud.org. Um, I would also direct you to the um, dissenting view in, to the Carter Baker Commission, which um, the Brennan Center and um, Professor Overton drafted together, um, which responds largely to the recommendations of the Carter Baker Commission on ID. There's a great deal of data in there that you can take a look at. Um, there's obviously, that was done a couple of years ago, so that there's some updating that needs to be done. Um, I guess I would just, you know, I would leave you with the thought that I don't, I do not agree that it's just sort of a he said, she said. Um, I think there's voter fraud. I don't think there's voter fraud. Um, but even if that were the case, even if we actually had no idea about the levels of impersonation fraud, um, the question then is, as a constitutional matter and as a value matter when the right to vote is at stake, where is the presumption? 
Should the presumption be that the voter is dishonest and not entitled to have a right to vote unless they, they overcome some you know, proof burden to show that they actually are entitled to vote? Or should the presumption be that people who seek to register and vote are entitled to register and vote unless somebody who's trying to stop them from registering and voting has a reason to believe and evidence to show that they're not entitled to do so? It seems to me that in a democracy where the, the right to vote is preservative of everything that we stand for, the presumption should be on the side of the voter. Other questions? Yeah. Hi there. I have a, one quick comment, uh, although it's anecdotal, so I don't know how much clout it has. Mr. Kilner, you referred earlier to the problem of lax enforcement being an issue. Uh, I have, in 2004, I was a poll monitor for the election down in Detroit, Michigan, and I think that over-enforcement was the bigger issue, that the city clerk had actually instructed all the polling stations to check ID before allowing someone, before giving them a ballot to vote, and that wasn't even on the books, so they were essentially enforcing a law that didn't exist. Right. Um, beyond that, uh, my question for the entire panel is whether all this discussion about voter ID laws is really kind of missing the forest for the trees. And if we're talking about access to the polls, whether we should really be talking about expanding uh, people's ability to vote beyond a 12-hour window on a single day. Rob, do you want to? Yeah, well, I think, you know, um, the example of enforcement of a law that isn't even on the books um, helps make my point that whether you have the photo ID laws or not, you're going to have poll watchers, you're going to have city clerks sort of making up the rules as you go along. That's, that's a problem inherent to the system, one way or the other. Um, I think that there's great variety among districts across the country in terms of districts where you have county clerks who really understand the rules, others where they don't others where they're not even making an attempt to follow the rules, but they have their own notions. And again, um, I don't think that really speaks one way or the other to the utility of um, photo identification laws. Rob, let me just, I'm just going to pick up for a second on, on this question. Um, over the last five years, I guess since the 2002 election, the Department of Justice has actually made it a huge focus to go after election fraud and, and individual uh, voter fraud um, as well. And, um, you know, they have this whole project devoted to it, and they have this whole program on Election Day, and there have not been a lot of prosecutions. Um, why do you think that is? Well, I don't know, you know, my other life, I'm a white-collar defense lawyer. It's often difficult to know until several years have gone by what actually is, is in the pipeline in the system. So I, I don't think we'll really know, probably for a few more years, whether there's any prosecutions emerging um, or not. I also don't know um, how truly zealous that effort has been. I think we've seen a little bit through the window of the U.S. Attorney's investigation um, the extent to which there was disagreement with the, even within the government, really, as to whether to press that effort. Um, so it's hard to assess as an outsider how zealous the effort um, has been. There are cases in every election across the country um, of election fraud, of voting fraud, of one kind or another although, to be sure, less commonly fictitious voting. Um, even today, there is remarkably little enforcement of any of those laws, including coming from the Justice Department, partly because it's extremely difficult to enforce, partly because I think U.S. attorneys out in the field don't view this as a top priority issue. It historically has not been an area the Justice Department has enforced very aggressively. That's just the reality. I just wanted to take up the question that was asked. Um, there are a lot of things that could be done that are not being done or that are being done in some jurisdictions but not in other jurisdictions to make voting easier. I mean, there are states that give you a two-week period in which to vote. Um, there are states that allow you to register and vote on Election Day. Um, there could, there's, a, there's currently a state uh, that enables 16-year-olds to um, pre-register and have it kick in when they turn 18 and then go to a driver's license, get their driver's license. You know, their drivers will kick it in. So um, there are lots and lots of different things that we could all be thinking about and should be thinking about um, to make it easier for people to register and make it easier for people to vote in this country. And I think that we also should be thinking about the problem that, that Rob alluded to, which is the fact that what we have right now in this country is a total crazy quilt of election administration. 
you know, not only do we have 50 states with different systems, but even within a single state we often have hundreds of counties, all of whom are sort of, you know, lone wolves deciding what on earth, you know, how, how to implement their own state law. Um, there should be fundamental national standards below which the states don't drop. And we don't have those in this country. And um, we should all be um, advocating for them. I think we have time for one more. If there are, yeah. I'm sorry, Mr. Kellner, this is for you also. Um, just out of curiosity, if there were evidence that showed what the number of, um, on the one hand, interceptions or how many cases of voter fraud were prevented versus how many people who could have voted were precluded from voting under a voter ID law. In, in, in other words, if there's data that for every legitimate case of fraud that was prevented, you fill in the number, 100, 1,000, whatever, uh, legit, uh, people who would have voted didn't vote. Um, if there was that data, would you concede that voter ID laws are not rationally related to legitimate government purpose, or would there still be a basis for, even under rationality review, supporting those laws? You know, I, I think as a notional matter, if there were a really dramatic divergence um, between the number of people who, as you say, are intercepted versus the number of people um, intercepted and, and sort of impeded in some way from voting versus the number of people who are caught as fraudsters. If there were really dramatic diversions, I would certainly entertain um, the possibility that these laws are not reasonable and effective. Um, part of my point, though, is that we're each going to draw that, um, we're each going to do that calculus a little differently. It's fundamentally a value judgment as to weighing, on the one hand, some impediment to the right to vote versus, on the other hand, the need for integrity in the system. Um, and there's no uh, mathematical way to strike that balance. It's a value judgment that um, legislatures and the people have to strike. I might strike it a little bit differently than you would. I don't know how I would strike it without you know, actually seeing the numbers. Um, before we have that kind of data, um, I would want to see some indication that we're talking about a serious impediment to voting rather than what I perceive, and I think the vast majority of Americans perceive to be modest additional steps to deter voter fraud, enabling anybody to vote with the proper identification, certainly requiring people to obtain that identification, and I suspect over time people would adjust to the new rules to the extent that they don't already have identification. I also suspect there are many people who, with photo ID, would not vote, and without photo ID, those same people would not vote. That's another relevant statistic one would have to look at, comparing the world as it is today to the, wor to the world as it would be after a photo ID requirement. I think we're going to have to let Rob have the last word so we can let people go uh, to the Hill. But um, thank you so much to all the panelists. And thank you for coming.